Hello, hello, Michael Lombardo here. Welcome to Awaken Podcast. Today we're going to be talking about a very important subject. We're going to be, we're going to be talking about hey, what's you know, you know an introvert, an extrovert can 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 you know is, is is evangelism only for the extroverted people that love to spark conversations with people, or can introverts really be used powerfully to share the good news and to do evangelistic work, sharing the gospel of Christ? And so you'll definitely want to tune in and listen to this episode. If you are new to the show, every Monday we're releasing a new episode on Charisma Podcast Network. Com. You could also go to Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Audible, pretty much anywhere podcasts are listened to. You could also go to our YouTube channel. All the video interviews will be on YouTube. So when we travel and we do the podcast, as well as right here in studio, having a lot more guests in studio locally when they are in Dallas, where I am located. And so make sure to tune in on YouTube, subscribe, rate, you know, like, comment, all that good stuff so we can get it out to more people. But I've got an amazing man of God on the show today. I want to dive right in so we have as much time as possible to dig into this subject. Um, I haven't heard many people talk about this. You know, I've done a lot of equipping in evangelism, and we speak specifically to extroverted, introverted type of people, people that are more inclined to start conversations, other people that are more to themselves. And, you know, we've spoken about this a bit on the podcast in the past, maybe a year or so ago. You know, evangelism does come up frequently, but we want to dig into this because, you know, this podcast, first of all, awake, awake, O sleeper, rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. Ephesians 5.14, the Lord is awakening the body of Christ so that we could see who Jesus is, all that he's done, and we could walk in the power of the kingdom of heaven. The Lord is speaking to all believers to share this good news. May may the redeemed of the Lord say so, and that is all of us. We've been redeemed, and we must say so. We must invite the world into this beautiful relationship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so I've got an amazing man of God. He's a minister. He's a pastor. Um, Had him on the show before a few years ago. His name is Benjamin Williams. Um, Him and his wife, they're the founders of Life Ministries International. They also pastor um, the church at New Bern in, New, in North Carolina. He's also authored a few books as well, one entitled The Basics in 21 Days. Also another book, we actually spoke about it a couple years ago, entitled Robbing Hell. Um, also his newest book entitled a- uh, Activating Introverts in Evangelism. And so um, his ministry has seen over 55,000 people come to know Jesus Christ and also they've trained hundreds to do the same. There's a big thrust of their ministry, training people, all people, um, to share the good news of Jesus. And so, Ben, thank you so much for joining me today. Michael, it's a real honor to be here, and I thank God for what you're doing in this ministry and how so many people are being equipped through you really laying your life down for the kingdom and saying yes to Jesus in this way. It's a big deal, and I'm just thankful to hopefully throw a little stick in the fire that's happening there and uh, some people to pick that up. And and I just want to see, I want to see hell emptied. I want to see heaven filled. I want to see Jesus glorified. I want to see every person equipped and, and empowered to share the good news of Jesus. And and it's my belief that, you know, maybe this right here will just be a moment somebody feels equipped and they feel helped to bring that good news of Jesus to somebody else. So thanks for having me. Oh, man, absolutely. I believe in what you're doing. I love your heart. Um, we need more people talking about this, equipping the body of Christ to share the good news, to do the Great Commission. And so before we dive into that, um, tell us a little bit about yourself. I, I shared a little bit about what you do. You pastor, you travel itinerantly, you, know, you author books. Tell us a little bit um, maybe about uh, how you came to know the Lord, but specifically maybe this journey of like learning to share the good news. Cause I know you don't consider yourself an extrovert. And so how did this, how did this passion kind of grow in you to do what you're doing today? It's really by the mercy and the providence of God and uh, the journey that the Lord has had me on. I still stand back and wonder about it. And I just also want to say, just give a quick shout out that uh, my wife and I are about to ce- celebrate 20 years married. Come on. And we have, three beautiful, incredible children, and uh, two that were in a miscarriage, so they're in heaven waiting for us. Mm. But we have have a 13-year-old, and we have an 8-year-old, and we have a 2-year-old. And Mm. uh, so you guys can pray for us. But uh, (laughs) I love my family. Uh, The Lord has really blessed me. And I get to pastor an amazing church. Church, the church at New Bern, uh, it's, it's hard to put into words what the Lord is doing here. 
And uh, so I'm really grateful for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, the Lord has, has had a lot of mercy on me. I can't exaggerate that enough. Mm-hmm. The, the Lord Jesus came to my mom when she was 10 years old in a dream and told her she was going to have two children. And the oldest would be a junior. And the second one, she would name Benjamin Wade. And uh, we're the my older brother, three years older than me. Uh, and I are the only kids that she's had. And he's mm-hmm. a junior. Of course, I'm Benjamin Wade. And uh, so the Lord told her what to name me when she was 10 years old. When I was born, the doctors said I wouldn't live to be five years old. Uh, they, I had it, I had the RH factor disease. And so if anybody's aware of that, it's where your parents have opposite blood types. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and normally back in the day before there was medication for it, um, the second child was viewed as a virus or some entity that got attacked by the mother's body and didn't survive. And uh, as a second child, that's what started happening to me. Mm-hmm. And uh, they gave my mom the medication that they had, but it didn't work. I was born premature. They said I was I was getting weaker and weaker. I was almost completely deaf. And uh, they said I wasn't going to live to be five years old. And uh, so my grandmother, and let me just wow. give a shout out to all the grandparents out there. Uh, she went <laughs> wow. to her pastor. It's a guy that uh, many people watching this may know. His name is Pastor John Kilpatrick. Mm. Uh, and he's familiar with the Brownsville Revival. Yes. Uh, he's the pastor that officiated my parents' wedding. And uh, my grandmother and grandfather on my mom's side were a part of his church in uh, One Robins, Georgia. This was before Brownsville. Mm-hmm. And I uh, went to him and asked for prayer. And he anointed my grandmother stood in proxy because we were over in a different state at that time. And um, she stood in proxy and, and he anointed her with oil and prayed for me. And I went in for my next checkup and they said, nothing's wrong with your kid. Wow. I have been completely healed every organ in my body completely restored, nothing wrong with my hearing. Uh, and then, uh, you know, by the, the mercy of God, when I gave my life to Jesus, when I was five years old, the year I was supposed to die by, wow. I was born again. Awesome. And, uh, awesome. I'm so thankful for that. I'm mm. so thankful that he's had so much mercy on my life, Michael. And in that same year, uh, I used to get up in the morning and just seeking the Lord, I used to get up in the morning. I watched Jimmy Swagger every morning at five o'clock with no alarm. Uh, I just got up and did it. And one day when I was watching that, the Lord spoke to me in an audible voice and he called me to preach the gospel. And so the year I was supposed to die by, I was born again and called to preach. <laughs> and I started trying to do that ever since when I was five years old. I started trying to preach to whatever would listen to me. I <laughs> uh, learned a lot, had a lot of mistakes that have happened over the years. Uh, but in relation to this particular question that you ask, uh, the Lord also broke my heart for the lost uh, simultaneously when he called me to preach the gospel. I would stay up at night as a child and I would see visions of the world with my heart over these different nations around the world. And I would weep for the lost. I didn't know what they looked like or what their languages were, but I would stay up at night, even a, as a nine year old, up into mm. nine years old, I would weep at night for half an hour, begging God to give me these lost, to give me this inheritance, to, mm-hmm. to allow me to be in the middle of what he was doing and seeing people reach my heart. I didn't know what I was saying. I didn't know how to pray. All I knew was just tears were flowing and my heart broke for them. And so I started trying to share Jesus the best that I knew how. And in the process of that journey, uh, I, I read a lot of books uh, and I listened to these things called cassette tapes. I don't know if you ever heard of those. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. The, I listened to the cassette tapes on, on this topic, I read all kinds of things, studied did all kinds of things. I ended up going to a master's commission in, um, in a, a church, incredible church in Biloxi, Mississippi, Cedar Lake Christian Assembly, and uh, did two years of schooling there. Started preaching officially when I was 16 and just started trying to study evangelism. I ended up going to North Central University in Minneapolis. I got a degree in evangelism from there. And while I was working there, Billy Graham Association was still in Minneapolis, and I worked at Billy Graham Association. Uh, and just tried to be around anything evangelistic that I could. Uh, and that's where I, I made I, I made a lot of learning, made a lot of mistakes. I did mm-hmm. preaching in all kinds of different ways. I've done a lot of different things. <laughs> and uh, in yeah. that, I've tried to, to bring together the things I've learned and help some other people. Yeah. And uh, somewhere in the process of that, I learned that uh, you don't have to be the biggest personality in the room in order to reach people for Christ. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that's a big deal. I think that's going to help some people to understand that 
uh, you don't have to be an extrovert. Now, what things I share about, especially like in robbing hell, uh, and also I've had people that have read and looking into uh, activating introverts, and they said, well, I'm, I'm not a, an introvert, but this stuff really helps me too. And, uh, you know, that I really want to give people something they can walk away with. And so I, after, I'll, I'll, let me back up and say this, I also went on staff at a church as an outreach and discipleship pastor, yeah. uh, River Life Church in Sauk Center, Minnesota. And uh, then through a series of relationships, ended up working at Global Awakening for Dr. Randy Clark mm -hmm. in uh, his ministry school, Global School of Supernatural Ministry. And mm -hmm. uh, my wife worked there actually before I did. And later I got hired after I went through the school myself. And so um, I, uh, we were at Global Awakening for 11 years and we're ordained with Global Awakenings Network and still in good relationship with them. And uh, so that's a little bit of that, a little bit of that history. Sure. Um, just trying to learn different things and all kind of different approaches to reach people. So I sure leaving a lot out, but that's, that's a little bit of snapshot, I guess. <laughs> no, a hundred percent. And I read, uh, I read through your book and there is, you're right. A hundred percent. There is a lot of, first of all, encouragement, scriptural revelation that will bless anybody, encourage anybody, strengthen anybody. You don't need to be an introvert to be able to receive. Um, but there is a lot of practical tools and insight and encouragement that someone could grab who just wants to get started in evangelism, regardless of what their personality is, whether they're an extroverted person, whether they love to talk or whatever. It just gives even just you know, certain conversation starters or how to flow into you know, uh, praying for somebody and kind of how to do that in, in the right way instead of being abrupt and how to handle different things, really practical, which is great because it's not just like teaching, teaching, teaching. You have that in there. You have, you know, the word is being broken down. You are teaching, but there's also a lot of practical steps and, and tools that you give people on how to start conversations and things like that. Um, what I would love to start with, because what you told me when you were sharing your story is that the Lord broke your heart for the lost. He gave you compassion he broke your heart for the lost, and you share about this in your book, and I find this to be vital. We really need to know the heart of the great commissioner. We need to know him intimately because then he begins to share his heart for uh, his heart for us, but then he also shares his heart for the lost to us, and then our heart breaks for what breaks his heart. And, you know, some people might look at you, Ben, and say, yeah, you've written several books on evangelism. Yeah, you're equipping the body of Christ in evangelism. You're an evangelist. And when you were young, you got a heart, you know, and a call because you're an evangelist. But the Word of God states that there's apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists to equip the saints to do the very same work. And yeah. so you you may have an evangelistic call in your life as an evangelist, and you know you're calling way deeper than I do, but just being someone who is your pastoring, but you also are equipping the body of Christ in evangelism, you have that evangelist call on your life, but at the same time, you are to equip, that is the purpose, to equip right. the body of Christ to do the work of an evangelist. And so, I don't know, I just, you know, there's... I just feel like compassion is huge here. And just because you had a major call where God downloaded um, his heart in you and gave you compassion for the loss, that's not just because you're an evangelist. God wants to do that for the everyday believer who's in the business world, the everyday believer who's maybe you're maybe, you know, you're in college right now. He wants to break your heart for for those around you in college. And so we'd love to maybe start there. I really appreciate that because it, I told you there's there's a providence on this thing and there's a mercy of God on it. it. You know, when the Lord healed me and called me in the ministry, it wasn't because I was a cuter baby than somebody else nearby. You know, it's really <laughs> the the idea of if if God could do something through this boy, then there's hope for other people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's really many times what the providence of God is about. It's saying it's like the Apostle Paul saying that I was the worst of sinners. And yeah. God was going to do something through me, you know, that would show his glory that he could do that. And I really feel like there are some times where there is this move of God on someone in such a way that people know that had to be God. Mm -hmm. I grew up in, in poverty. Uh, I grew up in broken home. I grew up in an environment where uh, a lot of people that I had a relationship with got kicked out of school or they quit school and, you know, people were having abortions and people were on drugs and there was abuse and alcohol. Uh, I grew up in that kind of area. And my mom was working three jobs trying to keep food on the table. No one would look at me as a child and say, now this guy, he's going to go to the nations. 
You know, he's going to see, he's going to write books. He's going to mm-hmm. you know, influence people. He's going to see many people around the world give their life to Jesus. He's going to preach in some of the biggest places around and mm-hmm. have these kind of relationships and be a part of revivals. No one would look at me, you know, except maybe my mom, of course, yeah. <laughs> thank God for mom. But, you know, outside of that, there was nothing in the natural. And it was, and, and sometimes God does something in people's lives that to, to really demonstrate his glory, but he does it in a way to replicate it. Mm-hmm. You know, that the it, it, it's not just something that they hold on to for themselves. Like you said, the evangelist is to equip other people for the work of ministry. And That's so right. God might bring an understanding, an illumination of Scripture, an anointing, do a sovereign work in somebody's heart uh, that they can never take credit for. Uh, but it's not done just for them to hold on to. Now, uh, they God, many times, if someone's called to equip other people, God will will move in their life in a way to replicate that. And so, yeah, the Lord broke my heart That's good. as a child for the lost, but we have to steward that. And there are things about prayer that are important when it comes to praying for the lost that the Lord has given me along the way, because just because God broke my heart for the lost as a child doesn't mean that would continue on and that he would just sovereignly randomly break my heart for the loss as I kept going. You know, he was breaking into my life in a way where he was marking me for his kingdom, but I still had to steward that. I still had to pray. And I found many times perspective is what helps people in prayer. And one perspective that's very important is to understand that God hears you when you pray, that he is, you know, I I like to tell people this, that God loves you and it's not your fault. (laughs) <laughs> you know, that that it's it's not your fault that God counted you worth dying for. You didn't earn it. You're not intrinsically valuable according to your own gifts or ability. He's the one who marked you. He's the one who decided you were worth dying for. And when you know that, then you know that salvation isn't something that's owed to you. It's something that's given to you. It's a gift from God. In other words, God wants you around for a really long time. Mm-hmm. And he's not just saving you for now, he's saving you forever. He's And what that means is he's not tolerating you. Mm-hmm. That's a big deal for prayer, because sometimes people pray and hope that God, you know, if they catch him on a good day, will hear what they're praying. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, uh, the, the truth is God loves you, and he loves He loves it when you pray. He loves it when you, you have a heart of faith that he mm-hmm. hears you when you pray. I think of Jesus standing at the tomb of, of Lazarus, and he said, Father, I thank you that you hear me when I pray. I recommend praying that way, that when you get started praying, say, Father, thank you that you hear me when I pray. Start that way. <laughs> Do something in your heart. Yes. And and so knowing that God hears you when you pray will help you with 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 knowing you're not making a wishful, you know, wishful, wishful, thankful, you know, praying on a star, hopefully something good happens, you know, but that you're really talking to to your father who loves you and hears you. Another thing for perspective uh, is that every platform is every, I'll say it this way, every interaction that we have is a platform for worship. And the reason I say that is because Jesus said, when you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. Mm -hmm. Every person that we interact with, Jesus counted worth dying for. Mm -hmm. And when you see that in this area of prayer, sometimes what I recommend people doing is going sitting out in a public place and don't be creepy about it, but <laughs> sit down in a public place and, and just help ask God to help you see people like he does. Mm-hmm. Start there. It's not a performance thing. You're not saying, I'm going to struggle and you know, I'm going uh, to make myself cry and I'm going to try to make myself pray for the lost. Just Go out and sit on a park bench or go walk around in a, you know, in a place where there's a lot of people that there's a lot of foot traffic and just ask God, show me these people, how you see them. And when you begin to see that every person you're interacting with, he counted worth dying for They're They're not divine or something. I'm not saying something silly like that. I, I, when I say it, it's because he takes it personal. It's kind of like you can be nice to me, but if you're a jerk to my kids, I take that personal, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, that and that's the same. That's what I'm trying to say is that when, when we see other people and we see the value he's placed on them, uh, then we honor him and we love him. We interact with somebody. Jesus takes that personal. He says, you've done it to them. You've done it to me. And when you see their value to God and you start honoring that, say, God, I thank you that you counted that person worth dying for. That's like worship to God. 
-hmm. when you begin to thank him for creating these people and the Lord begins to give you a heart for the people, for people around you. And another thing to do is, is to get involved in things that have you kind of rub elbows with people that aren't lost or that aren't saved, excuse me, people that are lost. Um, Because otherwise some some of these things can be abstract, but when you know someone, uh, then that can do something in your heart as well. And, Mm -hmm. and this, Go after God in prayer. God, I thank you for the mercy you've shown on my life. And I ask that you would have mercy on so-and-so like you had mercy on me. You didn't owe me salvation. You didn't owe to die for me. You don't owe me anything. But you put value on my life. You gave your son for me. You wanted me and your family. And I thank you for that. I can never earn the forgiveness that you've given. I'm so thankful that you've given it to me. And I'm asking for that mercy for this other person that you also count it worth dying for, and they don't know you. And I'm asking for your mercy on their life. Uh, your perspective will drive you to prayer. Your understanding of God's heart for people will drive you to prayer. Sometimes God will give you a sense of urgency, like snatching them out of the fire kind of feeling. Uh, you know, but it, you don't you don't have to try to make yourself feel a certain thing in prayer. You just, you have to, Ask God to help you see people and to see people from his perspective and and the other stuff will come. You just start praying for them. uh, And and those perspectives, I found a good way to steward prayer in my own life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's an element of trust and surrender in this thing where we, um, you know, the Apostle John, he states that if we pray something according to God's will, we know that he hears us and that we have the very thing that we ask for. We know that God's will is for us to be possessed with his heart, to have his heart on the inside of us, and for us to share him with the world. We know that's his will. We're not asking something selfish when we say, and we're not asking something contrary to his will when we're asking him to put his heart on the inside of us. Like, what? That is a genuine prayer. That is a prayer of humility, trust, and surrender, saying, like, God, put your heart on the inside of me. I acknowledge that I might not be the most compassionate person right now. I acknowledge that I'm not burning for the lost, that I'm crying for, for, for those who are trapped in darkness. I acknowledge that. You know that. I can't hide anything from you. You know what's going on in my heart. You know where I'm at, and I acknowledge where I'm at, and I say, I can't do this without you. I want your heart on the inside of me. Do a supernatural work on the inside of me. You do it, Father, because I can't do it. And when you come to that place in prayer, you're praying his will, and you could be confident that he wants to do that work on the inside of you because it's mapped out in his word. And, you know, it it could happen dramatically. It could happen, you know, with one encounter from the Lord, or it could just happen over time as you're out and about throughout your day. And I love what you're saying, just beginning to ask God, like, what is your heart for this individual? occupying some of your prayer time, not just in the word, not just praying for yourself or family or whatever, but just saying like, God, there's this, there's this individual that is frustrating me right now a little bit. What is your heart for them? Or Lord, here's somebody that I know that's trapped in darkness. What is your heart for them? And to really just begin digging in exactly like you said, or getting in a public place and just, you know, while you're eating, just praying like, God, show me your heart for these individuals. Just practicing that. There is a practice to this thing and we'll get better and better over time. We'll get more in sync over time. And um, I know you share in your book, in the beginning, you talk about your journey and how you didn't realize till later on in your life that you were more of an introvert and not so much an extrovert. You know, someone like Todd White, they would say, oh, this guy's supposed to evangelize. He can't stop having conversations with people, you know. But um, a lot of people that are listening or watching right now are saying to themselves, okay, activating introverts. Like, honestly, I felt the same way. I feel like maybe my calling is more to the church. My calling is more to men who are already saved. And and that might be true. You know, there's people that are called more to believers and equipping and discipleship or to broken men in the church to see healing and deliverance. But at the same time, we're all called to share our faith and and we all can. And so um, maybe share a little bit of your journey there and we can, we can get into that. Absolutely. I'd be happy to. And uh, let, let me let me clarify one thing here as I mm-hmm. get into this particular section. And, and that is uh, there's a difference between being an introvert and being shy. And mm. I find this as a, a major confusion for, with people. We, we often think being an introvert means being shy. And I found that not to be true. Just because somebody's quiet doesn't mean they're shy. Mm-hmm. Um, and 
So because of that misunderstanding, people think that introverts just need more love in their life. If you just love Jesus more, what you have is a, a fear of man problem. If you just love Jesus more then the love of God takes away fear, and then you'll share Jesus more. And we have all of these kind of things. There's no real such thing as an introvert. You know, everybody should be sharing Jesus. You just need to love God more. And if you do, then you'll be a witness. And, yeah. and I just find that particular mentality um, normally comes from someone who's an extrovert. And so the idea is uh, if you love Jesus more, like I've come to love Jesus more than the way it'll look is how it looks in my life. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the truth is <laughs> if somebody loves Jesus more, it could look all kind of different ways. You know, maybe if somebody falls in love with Jesus more, they will feel a real pull into the prayer closet like never before. That's what it looks like in their life. Maybe somebody will feel the pull to get involved in their local school system, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. Like that, it can look different ways. So to label it as you, your problem is you don't love Jesus enough uh, because it's a fear of man problem. That is, not, that's a mistake. Uh, because being introvert is not the same thing as being shy. Mm -hmm. And so this book is not really about, uh, it's not really about being shy. And so I want to clarify that. I don't think being shy is a gift from God. I don't think being shy is, uh, I don't, I don't think being, say it this way, that I don't think being shy is a personality trait. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the I've I've met extroverts that are shy, and the reason I discover that is because they seem to be really quiet uh, around uh, most people until you got them to a place where they were comfortable, or you got them mm -hmm. to a place where they were around people that they had strong relationship with, and then you couldn't get them to shut up. Yeah. like they just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk, and I'm like, what? What happened to this person? What's so different? And it, I began to see that that person is shy. They have a fear of man deal going on. Mm. When they're in a place where they're comfortable, they act completely different. And here's one of the, the clues for you. If you're an introvert, you're going to act the same pretty much the whole time. I mean, you might find yourself in an environment that requires requires you to talk more because of the the job that you're in or something like that uh, and it comes with a responsibility but in, that's different than uh, acting different around different places that you're comfortable around if you, mm -hmm. whenever you're in an environment that you're comfortable if in one if you act the same if you're quiet around uh, people that are you're always comfortable with and you're quiet around people that you're not comfortable with that that's probably not shy or if you I tell people this that the, the way you know someone's an extrovert is because they talk yeah you know <laughs> they talk all the time especially and if they're shy that that gets in there and get, get where it gets confusing but in general extroverts talk you know they uh, they're all it's easy for them to to learn ways of sharing the gospel because they're already talking anyway Mm -hmm. It's just inserting Jesus into the conversation. <laughs> and, um, you know, the, some extroverts, they talk and they talk in their sleep. That's how you know we're talking. So introvert, introvert talks a lot too, but they talk in their head. They talk inside. I tell people this, that an introvert talks on purpose. Mm -hmm. And this is what I began to find is, is as I grew up, I began to meet people that now I know are extroverts. But at the time, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't have that vocabulary. But as I began to learn uh, some of these words and how, you know, the, the ideas of uh, where most of your processing happens, where an extrovert processes externally and they get recharged by being with people. Mm -hmm. An introvert recharges primarily by being alone. Mm -hmm. uh, and it doesn't mean they're shy. It just means that because it takes more energy for them to express themselves naturally, uh, it, 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 they re, they need to be in a place where they're not being required to express themselves to recharge. That's all that it means. It doesn't mean that they have a fear of man problem or that they don't love Jesus. I want to take the shame off of introverts. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry for people. Anybody put condemnation on you and tell you you don't love Jesus enough and or different stuff like that. And, and you're supposed to talk to every single person you see. Otherwise they're, they're going to hell and their blood is on your hands and all this kind of stuff that people hear. Uh, I've heard over the years, and I just want to take that off of you. Yes. That in my own journey, what I found is uh, what God what God began to do with me is to to show me meaningful ways for me to interact with people, and where I didn't have to pretend to be somebody else. And this, this was a big key you might have seen in the book, and that's where um, introverts often, or at least in our stream, in my experience, a lot of introverts are um, are taught extrovert 
approaches to evangelism and it feels forced. It feels fake. It feels disingenuous. And so here we are trying to share the tr- truth and we feel like we're pretending to be somebody else. Mm. And so there's actually a conscious violation inside where people feel like they're lying in order to share the truth. And that's why it doesn't last very long. I mean, it doesn't become uh, I, an outreach doesn't become a lifestyle thing. Sharing Jesus doesn't become a lifestyle thing because um, it, the tools that we have feel awkward. They don't feel natural to how we're wired. And so then you have people under condemnation that they're supposed to be doing something, but they feel fake when they're doing it. Uh, and so they go through their life just saying, well, I'm just not equipped for that. I, that's for somebody else. You know, I'm supposed to do something else. And I've led people to Jesus who were turned off by extroverts. Yeah. <laughs> and they, they yeah, ran wow. from God because they encountered someone and how they, they interact with that person the, the way that they responded to it is uh, was negative. And I uh, just the the things that God helped me to do uh, to interact with them were things that that ended up seeing their hearts open to Christ. and you'll 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 reach people that others can't reach. and that's why I want to see introverts activated because there are people that need to hear Jesus from your personality and from your background. And they need to encounter Jesus in a way that you carry him, that your witness matters. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's really what this book is about. uh, And the things that God brought me on a journey of and all the, some of the journey of, uh, of being an introvert is going through these things. I've, I've tried door to door stuff. I've stood on picnic tables and preached. I've preached in concerts. I've preached in crusades. You know, I've, I've gone, I've went to fairs. I've done all, I've done all kind of, all kind of, different outreaches and all kinds of different evangelistic approaches. And uh, through that is where I started getting some of the tools of, of uh, helping introverts really, because what I found is there are certain things and what I, in the book, I call it a custom. If you can find some things that are your custom and you do that on a consistent basis, uh, then you'll find it feels authentic and you'll do it consistently and always being open to the Holy Spirit to lead you to do something else. It's not saying that it's like an outreach button that you turn off when you're not in that custom environment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, you have things that you know uh, are, are there seems to be fruit from it in your life. And so you want to consistently do that. And I found those happening in my life that there were certain situations that seemed to produce more fruit, more. What I mean by that is more positive encounters with people uh, either coming closer to giving their life to Jesus or uh, giving their life to Christ, either either one of those where there were positive encounters. Uh, and I began to note those and make those a practice or a custom, as I call it in the book. Yeah, I want to I want to dive into that a little bit more. Um, but I want to just kind of go back a little bit on what you said about there was people that you led to the Lord that were more introverted. And they said, like, wow, you know, like you realize that they they came to the Lord and you you saw that effectiveness in that conversation and in that moment because you weren't an extroverted person. And, yeah, you know, it's an introverts leading introverts to the Lord. But it's like, you know, I know people that get turned off by extroverted people. Immediately, boom, a wall goes up in their heart. They just don't want to deal with that individual, deal with that person. Everybody receives different individuals differently based on personality traits, right? And so I find that to be very, very true. And you were saying that, it really resonated with me because I've seen it in evangelism, I've seen it in sales, I've seen it in a lot of different aspects, right? You know, people buy from people they like. People receive, like if they are, if they if they feel comfortable with you, if there's a trust level there and you know how to speak to certain individuals because maybe you're the same and you receive information the same way, then they're more inclined to receive from you because of that. And so, but anyway, that's really, that, that's awesome. But I do love the, the chapter where you're talking about customs because it's, it's giving some beginning steps for some people to do. Like if their life does not reflect evangelism, if they haven't really tapped in or they haven't, you know, when they go to Walmart, they go in and they go out or when they're, you know, when they're walking around on their jog, they're not open to God speaking to them or they're not used to sharing their faith. And people right now are saying like, no, like, yes, I, I am aware now that this is something that God wants me to do. He's been speaking to me about this. How can they start adopting this in their life without feeling like they're just completely changing things or it's a huge, it's a big daunting thing that they, you know, keep putting off because they're afraid to step into it? Well, um, I'll, I'll want to speak into that, but I, I do want to back up for just a moment and give mm. some love to my extrovert friends and ambivert <laughs> friends who or people are like, I'm either one of those. I'm kind of in the middle. Uh, I just want I'm to in give the middle. Some, I'm in the middle. Yeah, I just want to give, the, give some love to these folks. And 
And when I'm highlighting introverts, I'm not, I'm not intentionally trying to put an extrovert expression of Christ down. Uh, I'm trying to free some, some introverts from to, to really know they have permission to do some things in their own personality. And so please, whatever personality you are, be that with Jesus, you Mm -hmm. know, and, and I love, there's a lot of people that get saved because of how extroverts minister. And I celebrate that anybody's given their life to Jesus. I celebrate that. And so Mm -hmm. me saying that I've led people to Jesus who are turned off by extroverts, that's, that happens, but extrovert wasn't trying to turn them off, of course. Uh, and I, I just trying to encourage the introvert that there are people they will be able to reach that uh, probably won't be reached by an extrovert and that there's room for that. And so all of us, there's room uh, to be us in Christ and knowing that it's it, it's really God who draws them. Mm-hmm. And it's our job to be a witness. We It's not our job to make somebody get saved. And so in that, you have that freedom to to be a witness and to learn things that help us to be an uh, an effective witness. Um, But don't think that uh, somebody giving their life to Jesus is a personality trait. We all need to be witnesses. I just want to say that and give a, a, give a high five, a shout out to extroverts. Please love Jesus more. Please talk to every person you see, please be you. We want everybody being a witness for Jesus. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the reference to to customs, this was something that's really important and powerful for people. I found that Jesus had a custom and the apostle Paul had a custom. You see in Luke chapter four and verse 16, it, the Bible says that Jesus went to the synagogue as was his custom. And in Acts chapter 17 and verse one and two, you see the apostle Paul also had a custom as well. And these are customs are things that you do on a regular basis. You don't have to be led by the spirit to do it. You mm-hmm. always do it. You, these are things that you, you have already heard from the Lord or whatever that you don't need to hear every single time mm-hmm. that you do it, make it a practice in your life. And uh, when it comes to the area of evangelism, I think the prayer we started with is a good uh, starting place because um, we need to see people and, if, and, having that time of, of thanking God for those that he counted worth dying for is a great way to start seeing people to make that mm-hmm. a custom start with that, uh, that, uh, we have a, it's very easy, at least for me, kind of a type a personality. It's very easy for me to run in someplace and run out, not trying to keep people out or because I have a fear of man or I don't love people. It's my mind is on what I'm doing. What I'm, I'm actually in my mind, I'm on the thing I'm doing after what I'm doing, Yeah, you know? And, the, uh, and so sometimes we have to, we do have to change some of how we're living. If we, if we want to get different results than what we have, then we are going to have to change what we're doing now. Cause if we keep doing the same things we're doing now, we're going to get the same results that we're getting now. Mm-hmm. And so there is some change that needs to happen, but it needs to be a thing that is connected uh, with something that feels authentic to you. Mm -hmm. And some of that will come by uh, prayer as you're praying, the Lord will lead you into some things. Some, some of that will come by uh, experimentation. I get a a lot of examples, both in activating introverts and a a lot more. I get a lot of examples in robbing hell Mm -hmm. Uh, that if you look at those books and you just scan through the different stories, I've, testimonies and I have all kinds of different approaches and different things to say. Uh, if you scan through those, try some of them out. Uh, that that's a great way to get some ideas of where to go. Uh, but the one of the starting places is is take the earbuds out of your ear and and <laughs> uh, be somewhere where you're at. Because uh, it's hard to minister to someone else if you're listening to music or you're listening even to a great sermon somewhere or, or you're listening to a book and you're out in public. Take take the take the ear earbuds out and be there, mm-hmm. and uh, and allow God to show you people, mm-hmm. and then in that look for things that uh, can become your custom. I can give some examples if you want to. Yeah, please. Uh, I don't know if you want to go that specific, but um, you know the there people have different things that work for them. What I mean, work is they have positive encounters with people and it seems to produce fruit in their life. And so uh, one of the, one of the things I've seen positive fruit in my life 
uh, is looking for ways to bridge a, a, an idea or practice that's in society that, uh, and connect that to something spiritual. Mm-hmm. So I'll give you an example. I say this in the book that when you go out to eat, it's very common for servers to see people pray before they eat. And so I found that when that happens, I did this yesterday, uh, made it, I've made it a custom in my life that when they bring the food, I'll say to them, I'm about to do something you've seen happen a million times. I want to pray before I eat. And then I'll, and they look at you like, oh, okay. And then I say, the reason I'm saying that is because I want to know what's going on in your life that I can throw in or include on my prayer, whatever your personality is. And, um, and I've had people literally start weeping right mm. then. I've had, I've had servers that pull up a chair and sit down. Mm. I, and even yesterday, the server just started pouring out all these things that were going on uh, that were really heavy things and just trying to make it through the day. Yeah, I've seen so many servers all around the world give their life to Jesus just because I asked, what's going on in your life that I can throw in on my prayer? Well, I'm going to pray for my food. And uh, that's where you're leaning into something that's already happening in society. And so there are ways to do that, uh, finding things that make that that connection with people. Um, and so, again, I have a lot of examples sure. in the book. I don't know if you, how many you want me to give, but that's one. Yeah. That's a practice. That's a custom in my life that uh, unless I feel like God is wanting me to really stay focused on who I'm at a meal with, uh, because I'm not performing. See, the deal is I want to, I want to free people in this, that you're, you are called to be a lover and not a performer. Yeah. And in that, that sometimes when you hear tools and ideas for evangelism, uh, it can become this performance thing. Well, what happens if I don't talk to somebody and I gotta, I've got to do this, I've got to do it. And it becomes, uh, really, uh, this work mentality and performance gets into there. And so sometimes I'm with people and I don't do that. And I'm just supposed to be with who I'm having a meal with. Uh, but if that's not the case, then I'm going to be praying over my food anyway. So it, it's very easy uh, for that to be a custom that I have. And I, I know others that I have that's in the book that if somebody, a, a telemarketer calls and they get lots of telemarketer calling, mm-hmm. uh, they'll ask God to give them a word of knowledge for that person. Mm-hmm. And they've seen a lot of people get saved over that way. They're already interrupting their day. Uh, you know, you could have... <laughs> You could have a custom where uh, you you don't interrupt somebody's life, but you wear things that cause somebody else to interrupt your life. And uh, I've seen this as an incredible practice uh, where uh, if somebody gives a compliment to something that I'm wearing, I ask God to give me a prophetic word for that person. Absolutely. Because the Bible says that when people are around prophecy and the the secrets of their heart are exposed. Their response to that is God is among you. And you see that in Nathaniel's life in John chapter one, that when Jesus prophesied very simple, very simple things, he didn't do a five minute prophetic word. He just said, here comes a true Israelite. And he said, how do you know me? And he said, I saw you under the fig tree. That was it. It wasn't a really long, complicated. It's like one sentence prophetic word. Yeah. And he falls down before him. He's like, you are the son of God. Like that's how he replies to that. Mm-hmm. And I've seen prophecy a really powerful way to um to to lead people into that personal encounter with god and so i can get into some of that as as you will because i in the book i talk about um that the the power of the holy spirit and his help Mm -hmm. the demonstration of the spirit and power in our lives is our secret weapon as introverts because you don't have to have a certain personality for it so um Yeah, I love that you talk about no pressure because, you know, at the same time, like we want to be led by the Holy Spirit. There are commands in Scripture, but, you know, I used to beat myself up a lot about this. If I wasn't always sharing the gospel, I put a ton of pressure on myself and became a performance thing. And the Lord told me, he said, son, you are not the savior of the world. Jesus is. And it's all about sowing seeds, watering, and God will bring the increase. You know, just like that right there, you're not you're not saying, hey, you need to get saved, and hey, you're a sinner, and we're all sinners, and we all fall in short of the glory of God, and so the gift of God is, G- you know, like there's, you know, you you just said, hey, is there anything I could pray for you? I'm about to pray for my meal. Is there anything I could include in this prayer for you? And then people open up. Some people might not. Some people will. But at the same time, like you're just sowing seeds. You're not putting pressure for them to receive Christ. 
You're not putting any kind of pressure on them. You're just loving on them and you're sowing seeds or you're watering. And the Lord is going to be the one who brings the increase. We just got to give the Holy Spirit something to work with, essentially. Yeah. And we need yeah. to we need to be able to we need to be able to close and 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 really lead somebody in a prayer of faith um, and surrender um, if that's what the moment merits. But the moment's not always going to merit that, right? And so well, and I'll I'll tell you this, Michael, that one of my desires is to bring people and count bring people into an encounter with Jesus before their walls go up. Yeah, because most people in our society they think they know who Jesus is, and so if you come at them super obvious about it, then their walls immediately go up, mm -hmm. and their their hearts are closed because of whatever they think they know about him or whatever experience that they've had. And so, you know, one of the things that like I, that example that I gave, when people start opening up uh, and and share something and pray for them, it opens for natural spiritual conversation after that. Mm -hmm. It's not awkward. It's not forced. Yeah. It's in it's uh, in the process of the meal. I'm asking God to give me a prophetic word, something that will. The way I view prophecy is, um, as far as evangelism is concerned, is Jesus told Nathaniel in John chapter one, "I saw you under the fig tree," and I feel like there's something really important about prophecy that makes the abstract idea of God very personal. Mm -hmm. That God showed me this for you because He wants you to know that He sees you. Mm -hmm. And um, and and having that natural interaction where it goes from this moment of hey I'm going to pray over my food to they bring the bill over and say hey thanks for letting me pray for something that matters so much to you mm -hmm. and while I was eating I was praying for you and I felt like God showed me something for you yeah and that moment I've seen people healed words of knowledge prophecy people weeping and people giving their life to Jesus right there at the table and so yeah I think. I think that is a, that's a fun custom for me. It may not be something that other people get into. You got to find your custom. Everyone's, Some things. Everyone's got their own thing. Experiment, yeah. By experiment, why I give a lot of different ideas uh, in between the two books I highlighted because um, between those, I'll give you enough ideas for you to to have a few things to get to, <laughs> to give a try at. I feel like and, there's uh, pastors like listening to this, teachers, pastors, uh, leaders in the body of Christ that are listening to this, and they've been looking for tools. Um, to equip their church, equip their people, equip their friends and family in sharing the good news, leading people to Christ, ministering the gospel. And so um, tell us how people can get a copy of your book, how they can partner with you in getting this message out. Um, and I know you do a lot of equipping, not just at your church, but um, you travel and you minister and you partner with churches. And so um, tell us a little bit about that, and then I'll put the link. If there's a website, I'll put the link in the description section below. But how can people connect and kind of you know, rally along the message too. Well, I love pastors. I am one and I love seeing pastors in their, in their churches equipped to rob hell, to lead people to Jesus, see people on fire and equipped to do that. And so I've, I've been training people in evangelism all over the world for a number of years. And, uh, it's, it's a great honor to do that. And so I actually feel right now, God is calling me into a season of having equipping uh, conferences called Activate, Activate Evangelism. And it's not just for introverts, but it'll have things in there that introverts could really draw from. And uh, so, if, uh, you know, I have things online that pastors can get to, uh, and you can go to releasinglife.org, releasinglife.org, uh, and you'll find different things that are on there in uh, the materials area. On the website, we have a, a book for new believers called The Basics in 21 Days. You can check that out. And we have a book called Robbing Hell, How to Reach People God's Way. You can check that out. That's a pretty thick book. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you, we have, of course, Activating Introverts, which um, is not a, a thick book on purpose. Mm -hmm. It's an easy read uh, intentionally. And we have that. We also have uh, an online course on evangelism called Activating, or, I'm sorry, called um, the evangelism intensive. And so you'll see that over there as well can be a study uh, that where there's video and teaching that's happening over there. And if a, a pastor wants to have me out, I travel once or twice a month as a pastor and go out all the time. Uh, but if there are people that are interested in, in that, then on the website, uh, there is a place where you can fill out an invitation form and I'll be in touch with you about details. If you have questions, you can email me and I'll give you a kind of a podunk email address here. Uh, it's lmi.contact 
at gmail.com. I know it's a Gmail account, but it is real. Yeah. <laughs> and so LMI dot contact at gmail.com. Uh, you can send me an email over there and uh, I'll be happy to interact with you. If you're interested in an Activate conference, um, then you know, reach out to me. I'd be happy to interact. And I also like, one of the things I like doing with pastors as well is meeting with uh, their staff and looking at some different dynamics because, you know, uh, we want to see people reached and discipled, right? And so uh, I understand experientially that evangelism does, it doesn't always equate to church growth. And it's good seeing people share their faith. It's a kingdom thing. It's not just about individual church growth. There are differences between evangelism and church growth. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I like to do is not only train on uh, evangelism and get people really activated in that lifestyle and calling people to serve in their local churches. You'll see that in activating introverts. I, I ask them, are you involved in your church? Uh, that's a way for introverts to really share Jesus with being involved in things that are happening in your church. But I also like to meet with church leaders and to help walk through some ideas related to uh, evangelism and church growth specifically, because they're not always the same thing. And so yeah. if you have interest in that, uh, you know, reach out to me and I'll be happy to to look at coming out to your to your neck of the woods. Well, thank you so yeah. much for, I'm going to put all the links here in the description section. And so people have access to all of that. And so thank you so much for joining me. Man. I love your heart. I love what you're doing. It's powerful. I love hearing the testimonies. I follow you on social media. You post a lot of testimonies, awesome stuff that God's doing. And so um, it's really encouraging to hear, man. We need more people like you in the body of Christ. And I know you're, you're, uh, you're duplicating yourself and you're pouring into people and you're teaching people how to reach a lost, which Hey, that this is God's heart. It was for the joy set before him that he endured the cross. And that joy was that many sons and daughters would come to glory. And so we get to partner with him. We get to walk this out with him. And so, Ben, thank you so much, man, for joining me today. It's awesome talking to you. Michael, thanks for having me on here. And can I just say a quick prayer for those that are watching? Yes, please do. Yeah. Heavenly Father, I thank you for those that are taking time out of their day uh, to spend on this particular podcast. And I bless them. I ask for a fresh touch on their life, for encouragement. I pray for any heaviness over them to be lifted off and that you would be the lifter of their heads right now. Anyone who is wrestling with depression, I pray that that would be snapped off and that we would see Jesus in a, a more clear way within us and we would see the hope of the glory of God. We would see your heart and your passion and they would, they would experience breakthrough in their life as only you can give. And God, I just ask that you would birth your heart within us for those that don't know you. Mm -hmm. Lord, I ask that you would stir our hearts and draw us into that place of prayer and that we would see the fruit of that intercession. We would see the fruit of that prayer that we would say, God, make us a laborer. The harvest is ready. Send me into that place. Show me how you want me to partner with you. I ask for an anointing on these people. The Lord, put a sickle in their hands. Let their, make them harvesters. Lord, I ask that you would do such a work within them that they would be amazed at how many people give their life to Jesus. That even when they ask somebody, do you want to give your life to Jesus right now? And the person says, yes, that it, it seems so easy that they stop and go, wait, are you sure? Like that would be just so easy. The harvest is so ready. God, I just pray that they would come knocking on their door, that they would come in such a way that it would seem like the, the people are getting saved left and right through their life and that they don't have to pretend to be somebody else to do it. Bless them. Give us, the, give us the souls, God. Give us souls, I ask. Give us the heathen as our inheritance to your glory, I ask. And I pray for lasting fruit, not just conversions, Lord, but for disciples. I ask for lasting fruit to your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Ben. What a, what a blessing, man. Thank you, Michael. Awesome. For those who are watching and those who are listening right now, make sure to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. So we get it out to more people so they can be blessed, they can be encouraged, they can be inspired, awakened by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Bless you guys, and I'll speak to you next time on Awaken Podcast.